Welcome, welcome to Creativity in Focus, a live podcast where every week we feature an artist and its art. And today is no different. We have a very special guest for you. But before we get started, a few announcements. We are live right now, and you may be watching us on Facebook, on YouTube, on Instagram, someplace out there in the, on the internet, right? Well, we are live for a reason. We really appreciate when you participate. So you can participate by giving comments, by submitting pictures of your creations, if it's aligned with our topic, and of course, asking questions to the artists. The, we always invite artists that leave what they create and they can give you a view that is really unique. So take the time to interact with us. How do you do that? Whatever you're watching, you have a chat box either beside or behind you or you have a comment box. That's the right place. Just submit that and we'll, I will get here and we'll be able to ask to my artists today. Okay. The other thing is, as in any social media, it's really important that you give us a like, a heart, give a comment, tell us where you are right at the beginning when you start watching. Why? Because this tells the mechanism to show this video more so more people can enjoy all this interview. And if you happen to get just part of it, you, you know, it stays whatever you're watching so you can come back as many times as you want or even better, bring your friends and tell them, hey, check this guy out, it's really awesome what he creates. Okay, well, my guest today is Barry Gordmer, and I'm going to read his intro so you get familiar with what he does, because you know what? It's a really unique art. Barry Gordmer is an award-winning puppeteer, writer, and producer. He's been designing, building, and performing puppets since, since 1983. In 2003, he received a Telly Award for his puppet designs and his performance as Alfie the Alligator on the DVD series The Sound and the Furry. In 2000, Barry performed on the CD's Dream of Sorrows. I re uh, it received a Grammy nomination for Best Musical Album for Kids. In his spare time, Barry is a veteran writer, producer, and editor for NPR award-winning news magazine, Morning Edition. He is also an adjunct journalism professor at American University in Washington, D.C. Welcome, Barry. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. You know, the first thing I want to know is when did you have this idea about puppets? It started right about, I think, 1981, 82. I was a news reporter in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I interviewed a local puppeteer, a man named Donald Devitt. He had a puppet company called Gracio Productions. Mm -hmm. And I went to his basement workshop, and I just remember seeing all of these faces full of color and character, and just something inside me snapped. Don't know why. Uh -huh. And just by, uh, by coincidence, he was publishing a book on how to make puppets. And so I said to him, um, gee, my, uh, my aunt would really like to have one of those, those books. Do you think I can get a copy? And, right. So he gave me a copy, and I just played around with it. And the first puppet I made was pretty bad. <laughs> For some reason that I still don't understand, I, I tried to make a second puppet. And that one came out pretty good. In fact, I still have that puppet around here somewhere. And it started as a little hobby and then just grew into just ridiculous proportions, as you can see. <laughs> uh, you, you, you are a ventriloquist as well. What's the main difference by, between a puppeteer and a ventriloquist? Actually, I'm not a ventriloquist. I'm terrible at ventriloquism. I've tried to do it. Uh, so puppetry has been mo my bread and butter for most of, uh, most of my career, and we can sort of talk about that little career shift. But here's the, the big difference that, uh, that ventriloquists will tell you. Um, for puppeteers, they're hiding out of sight. Mm -hmm. The star is their arm on camera, and they're talking. Yes. But they're out of sight. Ventriloquists are on stage with their character. They are as much about the performance as the puppet itself. Huh. We have some pictures of your creations here. Is that okay if we show a few right now? Yeah, let's see what we got. Okay. Uh, actually, I've been asked to show some of the creations you have beside you. 
And they're very big guys there, right? Yeah, they, these are pretty big guys. So there's a ventriloquism convention happening just uh, in Cincinnati next week. They call it the convention, vent, ventriloquist. And so there'll be about five, 600 ventriloquists there watching each other perform. And also a part of those ventriloquism conventions are people who make ventriloquist figures for people who are trying to, to buy them. And there's all kinds of figures there. The traditional wooden Mary, uh, 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 ventriloquist dummies will be there. And this is what's called soft figures. These are more like the Muppets. And um, so these are some of the guys I'll be bringing. I'm in the process of making more. And uh, so uh, right here, uh, we have Uncle Mort. Um, he'll be there. And these figures are about, if they were standing up, they're sitting right there, sitting down now. If they were standing up, they'd be about three feet tall. Wow. Uh -huh. and, and what are they made of? They're made of foam rubber okay. covered in fabric. So soft, squishy foam rubber. And that squishiness and softness helps them move and gives them a lot of expression. It's also, it's a really interesting sculptural medium because it's firm, it holds a shape, but it's very lightweight at the same time. And that's really critical, particularly if with puppets, if you're trying to hold your arm up over your head for a long period of time, you want it to be lightweight. But it's a material really that um, came into use with puppetry with, with Jim Henson, uh, beginning in the late 1950s, early 1960s. Mm -hmm. um, when he, he was... Um, um, interested in television. We think of him as a puppeteer, but he was really more interested in television and television production and what kind of materials would work well on television. That was part of his motivation as a puppeteer. And so that's become, for soft figures, that's the base material that, that soft figure makers use is foam rubber. Uh, different kinds of foam rubber. This is more like the kind you would find in your seat cushions. Uh-huh. Wow. He, uh, he's the same the the, the labyrinth, right? Yes. yes. So the, okay. so Kermit, Miss Piggy, labyrinth, but those were a very different kind of more sophisticated uh -huh. uh, puppet. And so um, my puppetry career first began really as a as a television puppeteer. The first most of the first thirty years I've been doing this have been uh, projects for television and video. And mm -hmm. so my building style was very much geared towards television and and using the, the types of materials that Jim Henson used and other so, things I picked up along the way. And is, is this one of the reasons why you go for a three feet tall? Um, well, the, the three feet tall, the, the size of my, my characters here are, are, are typical for um, ventriloquist characters. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, yeah, people are a little surprised how big they are. They're, they're, they're larger than they think because we think of a little hand puppet kind yeah. of uh, this little thing here, so that'd be pretty small. Uh, okay. But these guys got to have your hand inside them, and so you know, um, if you affect your hand, sure, right side of your mouth. And so if you look at these guys, I mean, their heads are about uh, the size of my head. Yes. Uh huh. So that helps keep the the proportions um, right. That's fantastic. Uh, you know, guys, I just want to remind you, this is a live podcast. If you have questions, please uh, leave in the comment box that you have below the video and we'll ask this expert. So, Barry, how long does it take you to create a puppet? It depends on the puppet, the materials, and, and how it's going to be used. In fact, uh, when a client calls me about a puppet, the one of the first questions I ask them is, how will the puppet be used? Will it be used for television? Will it be used for theater? Will it be used for ventriloquism? All of these things will have an influence on the design and the materials and the construction. But a basic puppet, a, a relatively simple one, I can do in about 20, 25 hours. Okay. More complex ones, 40, 80 hours. Some puppets I'm still not done with. But by complex, is some uh, other mechanism that you add to the puppet or just the sculpting itself? I, everything from the sculpting and the materials. Uh, 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 for example, um, if you're making a puppet for television, seams are very important. Um, seams on television, they don't look good. They, 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 depending on television lighting, the seams can be accentuated and create lines and on the faces that can alter the expression or shatter the illusion that it's a real character as opposed to um, a stuffed toy or a project. 
So um, a big part of what I do in my puppet making style is um, is hiding the seams and stitching in the way in a way that those seams will be hidden and using materials that hide seams well. For theater, that's not important because your audience is 10, 12 feet back you. even further. So if those seams show, it really doesn't matter. Okay. And you just mentioned that you're going to a ventriloquist convention, but I think we all grew up with the, the wooden dummies, right? Yes, so yes. Tell, tell me about how yours fit in this type of audience. Well, it's interesting because ventriloquism is going through a bit of a transition now. We think of those traditional wooden um, characters, Charlie McCarthy, um, uh, Edgar Burr and Charlie McCarthy, Danny O'Day, uh, Knucklehead Smith, Jerry Mahoney, um, were wooden figures where your hand is on a rod and there's a trigger mm -hmm. inside controlling the mouth and little mechanisms that you control with your fingers to do eye blinks and things like that. These days, many of the performers out there grew up on the Muppets, and for them, those wooden ventriloquist figures seem a little bit old-fashioned. Now, they're still very popular, and there's a, one of the great debates that uh, ventriloquists will have is, which are better, a, ventrilo a hard figure or a soft Muppety-like mm -hmm. figure? Uh, but they're both really, in the, in, the, in the hands of the right performer, they're both extremely perf uh, effective. Um, but um, I was asked to go to a ventriloquist convention 10 years ago, and I, and I brought my figures that looked like this. And I, I didn't sell anybody. People were very complimentary and very nice, but I sold very few and got very few orders. And then last year, somebody I met at that convention said, you really should come back to the ventriloquist convention. You'll find things have changed a lot. Hmm. And I went back and people were very um, open to my work. Um, and uh, I did very well. And I'm uh, doing a lot, of lot more business with ventriloquists now because things have, have changed over. So not only the generational puppeteers have changed, but also, of course, their audience also grew up with the Muppets and... Yeah, we we can say Sam, Sesame Street and also right. That's right. exactly yeah Sesame. So they're they look to used to that kind of look. Uh, Amanda Short is saying hi Shahar. Would you be so kind as to ask Barry the links and URL to his websites for sure, pages etc. Where we can see and read a more a more about his puppets. Thank you in advance. And of course you can mention your website. Just let me show some of your work before that. Is that okay? Okay. Go. okay is so it Go for We're it. going to see now, I think it's Abraham Lincoln there. Can you see Barry? Uh, don't see it yet. Oh, there's, there's Abe. Yep. Yeah. Boom. Um, did that f uh, uh, for a guy, I think, in Alabama had that in his show. Don't remember quite the reason. Yeah. But uh -huh. um, so uh, that was a puppet. And then that was probably close to 20 years ago. I made that wow. figure. Wow. In those days, I was covering the foam rubber with stretch terry cloth material in baby clothing. Um, very stretchy and hugs curves and was easy to hide the seams. It's getting hard to find stretch terry. Um, and these days I've switched to a, a different material, a, a nylon fleece, um, something that uh, puppeteers know as Muppet fleece, uh -huh. um, but uh, also known as Antron fleece. Uh, these days and uh, these days it's only used for two things puppets and for um mascot characters oh really yeah and uh so it only comes in white but it's really easy to dye all different colors and the reason that it's used is it has this really fuzzy nappy texture to it i want to see it get, see if you can see this but you can see that a little, little up, put it put up a, a little bit yeah, yes. there you go that kind of nappy, nylon-y look. So that helps you in hiding seams because you can stitch it together and then use a needle or the rough side of Velcro to pull those fibers up and it hides the seam. Really well, cool. So now we have two little guys here. Yeah. Oh yes, the, uh, the Bug Brothers, I call them there. The Bug Brothers. <laughs> So there's a performer named uh, Bobby Hill. Bobby Hill, he calls himself. <laughs> and Bobby Hill is quite the entertainer. He has a, 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 a little troupe called the Puppetoon, 
players and he goes around on this giant piano that has wheels on it that can roll down a parade route and he has several puppets that i made for him mounted uh to that that roving a uh, wheeled uh, motorized piano oh. and they um bob and sing and bob their heads and move their mouths and strum guitars to the music that's fantastic so, let's so see one more <laughs> Okay, we have a lion, lion here. here. Oh, yes, that's Lionel. Yes, Lionel is actually part puppet and part sculpture. Um, oh. His hair, his, his mane is made of feather boas. Mm -hmm. And it was actually a, a line of sculptures that I tried to market a few years ago called Boa Buddies because of okay. the feather boas. So... First of all, let's talk about your website because you have a very cool domain name for your site. So let, let everybody know where they can see more of your work. It's pandemonium.com. That's pandemonium only with an H. Yes. H-A-N-D-E-M-O-N-I-U-M -E dot com. Very good. So, Barry, I go to a storytelling festival that we have here in Utah, a very big one, and there's a whole... Um, block just for puppeteers. So all day long they have different puppeteers. But where people go to see puppets today? Well, e everywhere. I mean, puppets for as as theater are. There's still lots of puppet troops all over the country. Washington D.C. is one of the great hotbeds of of puppetry because of the Smithsonian Institution and all of the parks and the tourist business. And puppetry taking many forms, from marionettes, things on strings, as we think of, from the kinds of, of puppets that you have on your hand, to this style of puppetry, strolling puppetry in parks, and uh, puppetry in museums and libraries. It's still a huge, rich, rich tradition uh, from a theatrical point of view. Where puppetry is disappearing from a little bit, which hurts me a little bit, is television. Um, uh, for, as I was saying, the first years um, that I was doing puppetry, puppetry on television was, was a pretty huge thing, from Sesame Street to the Muppets to Between the Lions to Barney to so many outlets for puppetry on television. That's, that's sort of dried up right now uh, because of computer animation. Mm -hmm. Computer animation has become affordable for so many more television producer, producers now as opposed to the big uh, Hollywood productions. But puppetry is still very much alive and well, particularly in Europe. Uh, in, in the United States, we think of puppetry primarily as something for children. In Europe, uh, puppetry is uh, akin to dance and mm. puppetry as a form of political satire. There's a very rich tradition in, in England, in Great Britain. There was a television show that ran for about 15 years called Spitting Image. And that was all political satire with puppets that looked like politicians and celebrities. Very adult humor, very much not for kids. Wow. I, I should mention there's a puppet movie uh, coming out with Melissa McCarthy. It's uh, something called The Happy Time Murders, um, where she plays a detective trying to solve uh, some murder mysteries. And the humor is very adult in that. It is definitely not four kids, although it looks very cute and muppety, um, there's some, a lot of naughtiness in there, shall we say. <laughs> Good English humor, that's for sure. Now, you know, you were mentioning the, uh, the puppets being replaced by, by computerized animation today, and there was a very big discussion online about it. A few weeks ago, we actually talked about it in one of our episodes. The same thing happening with special effects studios that they also use to, to build the characters and sculpt from scratch, and that has been uh, replaced right, by, by right. this new thing. What do you, what think, do you think about, about the about experience the for the end consumer, though? Do you think same thing? You know, I'm, uh, call, I'm, I'm agnostic about uh, the notion that computers um, appeal, computer animation appeals uh, more to audience today. To me, it's still about the story, mm -hmm. number one, and number two, about interesting characters um, that you can sympathize and empathize with. And so you can do, if you have an interesting character with an interesting story, then you can tell that with computers or puppetry 
or you can shake Barbie dolls on the screen and you'll, you'll, um, you'll have an audience. Yes. So the, for me, the, the delivery method of the story is not as important as the story and the characters. Mm -hmm. I, I believe, I told you before we started, we went live, that I have a, a half puppet, right? I, I made a, a head and I didn't finish. Let me tell you for a second the idea behind that. A few years ago, I actually thought, okay, I'm going to create a podcast that is actually a puppet. And my reasoning, and it, the, that puppet would be talking about internet marketing. The reason behind that is because a puppet I see as a charismatic uh, character. He can't say things that, you know, me, even as an actress, for example, couldn't do it. Do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, you can get, certainly get away with things. And, and, and uh, <laughs> the, a puppet can be blunt or very direct in a way that a person can't without a person getting offended will we'll accept sort of things, certain things from puppets that we wouldn't accept from, uh, from people. Um, interesting you said uh, of some internet marketing. I did um, um, a proposal, uh, a prototype for QVC a few years ago, uh, a puppet character called Q-Bear, a teddy bear that would uh, sell, uh, you'd be used to sell, help sell uh, kids. Um, oh, that's so cool. Things, um, on QVC. Didn't quite work out though, it didn't go for it. I thought it was a great idea. Yep. yep. Uh, Amanda is saying, Amanda Short is saying, thank you very much, great name for your website and great information. I love being part of this interview for so many reasons. And guys, you can be part of this too. Here we are for you. This expert is here for you, this amazing artist. So ask questions if you have anything that you want to know, either about the process, the market. We are going to talk about the market in a second, uh, the life of a puppeteer. I'm going to show a few more pictures of your work, and you can comment a little bit on that. Ah, uh, yes, that's Milton. Milton, the worried accountant. I made him <laughs> uh, for the Ventriloquist Festival a convention last year. And he's living a happy life with a, um, a ventriloquist named Daniel. <laughs> and he had came up with a great voice for him. And he, he was a really fun character to make. Um, the, the, he moves really well. One of the fun parts about doing puppetry. So on one level, it's sculpture. It's sculpting of the foam. It's sculpting of the fabric. It's a form of sculpture. But it's sculpture that has to move well. And so it doesn't, uh, as a puppet, doesn't do any good if it looks good, but it's hard to move and hard to manipulate. And I was really uh, pleased in the way that, uh, that Milton moves. Uh, fun expression with him. And his eyes are, are fun on him. His eyes are made of plastic spoons. Ooh, tell me this, a little bit about this process then. Yeah, this is one of my favorite ways to, uh, to make, um, to make uh, eyes. Uh, cut back from the uh, cut back to me and I'll show you how this is done. Mm -hmm. So what we here have here is a spoon. A normal a, plastic spoon? A normal plastic spoon. But uh, my, my prop there. Ah, hey, here we go. Here, prop. Normal plastic spoon, but you cut off the handle, which leaves you with this part. And then what you do is drill a hole in the plastic spoon. And then when that hole is there, you can take a teddy bear eye and then pop it in if something starts to look like an eye. And then you can take a piece of fabric and like put it over the top and you get an eyelid. And you can buy plastic spoons in all different shapes and sizes. And they're really, it's hard plastic, so it's very durable, but it's a really fun way to, to make eyes. Milton's eyes were plastic soup spoons. <laughs> This is more the kind that you see in a lunchroom, so it's got a little more oblong shape to it. That's fantastic. Now, you, you talked about the sculpting process. Uh, when you mean sculpting in this case, is it soft sculpting with a needle that you do, or what is the process? Yeah, sculpting actually is a multi-faceted term when it comes with puppetry. So um, my puppets are starting with a flat piece of foam rubber. This is a half inch thick. This is the um, base pattern for uh, the head mm -hmm. of my puppet. So you can see the mouth down there. So if I start to glue this together, you get that round shape started there. And down here is the mouth, and you start to see oh, uh -huh. begin to look like a puppet. These darts on the top 
would come together. And so now you're getting that shape. So that's a gluing. I'm working on a head here. So this is a, a, a finished, the foam work has been finished and I'm starting to cover it with wow. fabric. Uh -huh. So um, if we compare it over here with uh, the captain, you can see what's at work here. Mm -hmm. so you see the cheek pieces there. And so the nose is going to go on like in this area. But you can sort of see it's the same pattern uh, who's on the captain there. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So mostly the glue is really your sewing process. Um, well, then the, there's also something like the cheeks. I'll cut a semicircle uh, 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 out of foam. Mm -hmm. And then using scissors, really fine scissors to sculpt and round and perfect that shape. Um, the noses, for example, um, Mort here has a very sculptural oh, look at that nose. nose. Love um, that nose. That's a material called L200. It's, um, um, with, it's a dense uh, foam, very mm -hmm. solid, as opposed to uh, a squishy foam. It's a dense, rigid foam. And so I'll cut out a basic shape on a bandsaw of his nose and then use um, a Dremel tool with a sanding drum on it to sculpt and round and get the shapes in there. Also, I'll use the tip of a hot glue gun to melt portions of it so I can do like so the... then you have the hose. So I can do the nostrils and uh -huh. things like that. So sculptural from that part. And then the last part of the sculptural process, as we were talking before, is the stitching. Stitching up the seams so they're invisible and stitching in a way uh, so they're hugging the curves. And so needle and thread sculpting, not quite like needle felting, mm -hmm. where you're actually... Uh, but needle sculpting. Uh -huh. But very much working the contours, changing the contours of the puppet's face. That's fantastic. That, that's like exciting. You get your juices flowing of what you could create. Yeah, it's, it's really fun. And um, the, it's fun to look for things to use, for, for, to use in puppetry. So plastic spoons... Mm -hmm. Great use for, for eyes. I spend an enormous amount of time on the eyes on my puppet because you know, the windows of the soul, so much of the character mm -hmm. comes from the eyes, from the expression on yes. the eyes, the shape of the eyes. So I'm always looking for different things to make eyes out of. So um, this is a wooden ball, mm -hmm. a wooden bead, and it's spray painted white. And earlier I showed you that that teddy bear eye, which I had in the plastic spoon, here's what it looks like if you take that teddy bear eye and you Ooh. put it inside the wooden ball. Mm -hmm. It's like drilled in there, made a little depth in there, but that's a pretty cool looking eye. Um, and it spoon. would be okay to have a puppet, for example, that is looking not straight, right? Oh, no, that's actually a really good point. A key to puppets, and this is what I tell people when they're looking to buy a puppet, whether they're buying a, the puppet for me, and I don't know why they wouldn't buy it for me, but <laughs> the, the, where the puppet is looking is critical. So particularly in television, um, eye focus is everything. You've got to know for the puppet to look alive, the eyes have to be looking like they're looking somewhere. So a lot of puppets you'll see are a little bit slightly cross-eyed looking. You might see mm -hmm. here on Chuck the Chimp, um, on the Countess here. Um, she has a very pronounced expression on her face. <laughs> She's adorable. Um, but it's the eyes are fixed, so they appear to be looking forward and focused. Back there on, on Sophie, her eyes, or his eye, I guess. Um, but they have to be focused so they're looking straight at you. So a lot of puppets that aren't as good, it might, see wall, might seem a little bit wall-eyed. The puppets seem like they're, the eyes seem like they're looking out this way a little bit. Or a lot of, of puppets, a lot of craft eyes that you can buy in craft stores, the eyes are looking down. Mm -hmm. And so that really, really takes away from the illusion of life. You want those eyes facing forward, looking straight ahead so they can, they can focus with and you. There's really a connection. And you're talking to your puppet. Uh -huh. You're establishing that connection with the puppet. With the when puppet. it's going out towards the camera, you're establishing a connection with your audience. That's so fantastic. the eye focus is really important. Um, this is a character that I made for a television production. This is Alfie, Alfie Alphadon, a prehistoric <laughs> possum. 
<laughs> so I spent an enormous amount of time on Alfie's eyes. Look at that. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. <laughs> and then um, <laughs> Alfie being a television production, his eyes were um, rigged up with um, blinkers. Whoops. Oh, I need, so you have a mechanism there to open and close that, right? Yeah, I have a... And it, uh, he's not working too well right now. Alfie, you're getting a little old on me. Come on. Ah, yeah, <laughs> there they are. They're, they're, they're sort of going, oh, the cable is twisted here. This has got a little cable control down here. Uh -huh. And my thumb goes in the cable. If I can get it untwisted, maybe we can get Alfie's, both of Alfie's <laughs> eyes to work here. Alfie's been around a while. Let's try this now. There you go. Ah, uh, ah, <laughs> uh, all right. Well, we all wish we worked that way, but there's a so, cable so control can mechanism. You, so one, one puppeteer can be operating the mouth, the eyes? Yeah, the, Alfie is actually a two-person puppet, so his hands, Alfie's hands, mm -hmm. are gloves. And so your hand, the puppeteer's hand, is the mouth. My, I control the mouth of the puppet, and my left hand controls his left hand. Okay. Another puppeteer would be Alfie's right hand, and controlling the eye mechanism. Wow, that's fantastic. I have a few uh, comments here for you. Jenny is saying, that's amazing. Loving how you made the eyes. Uh, let me see this one. Sandy finally made it. Hi, everyone. And he is awesome. And there was a purposeful <laughs> wink. <laughs> And, and we have uh, Amanda here asking if you would come to Curious Mondo. We are talking. We are talking. Yeah. Uh, would you consider giving a course at the same thing? Very. Oh, somebody is saying that you may have some glue on your beard right now. <laughs> yes, my wife just came down and pointed that out. Thank you both. <laughs> I have, here, here's the thing. I have glue on my beard. I have um, um, uh, but down here on my workroom floor, these little foam rubber clippings, <laughs> and they get everywhere. They stick on my yes, shoulder. they do. <laughs> and, and, and in my hair, and a lot of times for hair on puppets, I'll use feather boas. Okay, and they get everywhere. One time, my wife and I were eating breakfast, and there was hair. <laughs> there were little feathers um, in uh, in her scrambled eggs. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, it sticks in, and the foam rubber is, is like, gets static electricity, so it just sticks. It goes it, everywhere, yeah. It stays on everything, and it's tracked through the house. Yes, it's glue talk, on the beard. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the business side. So, as far as I understood, you have the line of ventriloquism, the puppeteers, and people that actually make puppets. They don't have to be uh, performers as well, correct? Yeah, right, yeah. So, how... How is the market for this professions today? Um, the market uh, for ventriloquism, we should talk about that uh, starting there. It's a really huge resurgence for ventriloquism uh, because of the show America's Got Talent. Um, three of the last, I think it's 10 winners of America's Got Talent were ventriloquists, including last year, uh, a 12 year old Darcy Lynn Farmer. Uh, from Oklahoma City. She sings, magnificent singing voice, but she sings with her ventriloquism characters. And she does these wonderful character voices and she sings with this incredible, powerful Broadway-like voice. Uh, Ten years ago, there was another singing ventriloquist, a man named Terry Fader, who won America's Got Talent. He now has a big Las Vegas show. Uh, there was another gentleman a couple, uh, like three, four, five years ago. I can't quite remember his name. But that brought ventriloquism um, to a very uh, new audience. Also, if you watch Comedy Central and HBO, you've probably seen Jeff Dunham. He's probably the most famous ventriloquist in the world right now. And he has a huge variety of characters, both soft figures and hard figures. And so ventriloquism is in a bit of a boom phase right now. And there's a lot of demand. Um, for ventriloquism, uh, ventriloquist puppet soft figures. And there's not a lot of people making them right no. now. Very small number. I think the number of people who connect, connect, collect aardvark toenails is bigger than the number of people who make <laughs> ventriloquist uh, 
puppets. You know, my audience knows what an aardvark is. <laughs> we actually have a, a live bash with sculptors where the challenge was to sculpt an aardvark. <laughs> oh, man, I would have liked to have been in that company. Yeah, right? <laughs> I, we, I, I think we have five of them here at the studio. <laughs> That's funny. Now, in, in terms of puppetry as a market, puppetry and theater is still alive and going very, very well. It's a rich, healthy heritage. Puppetry and television, not so much anymore. I did do a, a Toyota commercial last year, but the television market had really been drying up for me. Um, there's still a lot of puppetry done in movies, although you might not know it. J.J. Abrams, when he made, uh, directed The Force Awakens, the Star uh, Wars movie, he's a big fan of having special effects on set, what they call practical effects, mm -hmm. so the actors can interact with the, pup, with, with the special effects. So a lot of puppetry was part of the Star Wars movie making. I think the the fox was one, right? Uh, they fox. had a, the ice fox, I think. Uh, yes, yeah, the crystal fox. That was a, a practical effect huh. puppetry. And I believe I could be on the the last um, the last Jedi. The Yoda was uh, this time out was a puppet. Yoda in uh, the, uh, the, some of the Star Wars prequels had become a computer generated character. They went back to a puppet. Huh. Uh, interact with Mark Hamill in this Re latest The reason night. behind that? Um, I think it's probably a director's, um, uh, director's choice there because, again, uh, the actor is having something physically to interact with, with rather than trying to imagine um, something on stage there or on set with them. Barry Luan Bowen saying, this is just so incredibly fascinating. I would love to be able to take a class or workshop. All of the different materials and inner workings are like magic to me. Tammy Eversledge, Tammy Eversledge is a teddy bear maker. I love Darcy Lynn. Her videos made me create a Pinterest page about creating the puppets because I need another thing to make. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, Darcy influenced a lot of, uh, of people. She really captured people's hearts just a, as a wonderful performer, but really sort of bringing for me what the, what the magic of puppetry can be. You know, ventriloquists like people puppets uh, a lot, and, and I like making people puppets. Darcy had a combination of people, but animal puppets as well. Her Petunia, her singing rabbit, and she had Oscar, a singing mouse, and that's really bringing that magic uh, that's to life. You know, for me, puppetry works best when you're, something comes alive that really should come alive. Um, I'll give you an example of that. Now, here, here's a, a character that I made, oh gosh, t close to more than 20 years ago now. Uh, this is Einstein. <laughs> Einstein is a talking bust. And Einstein is made of latex rubber. Wow. And he's also a two-person puppet. So your hand goes down in there. He too has cable mechanisms. Let's see if his are still working. So I've got one of them right here, which will ah, get that on there, get the cable mechanism in there. That will make him blink. Oh. Okay. And then there's another m cable control down here. Whoop. Let's open your eyes back up, Einstein. And another one down here, which uh, makes Einstein's <gasps> He moves eyes. the eyes. Nice. Go side to side. <laughs> so he was a really fun puppet to make, different technique. Not, you know, so this is sculpture and mold making and casting and airbrushing a texture to get that, make him look like he's stone. But so, being late, the text rubber, he's very flexible. Really scrunch that face up. So when, he, uh, when does the choice of using latex come? When is uh, it appropriate? Yeah, it uh, depends again about the, what the project's going to be. The, then the needs of the project, uh, television versus theater. Um, I, I don't get, I don't, I enjoy doing the latex because I enjoy sculpting. I don't get um, uh, a lot of business on that anymore because it's, um, it's expensive and it, it tends to work really well on television, not as practical a medium for theater, yeah, um, for live performance, Global, at least the kind of latex I use. There is a guy named Steve Axtell and he has latex ventriloquist van uh, I'll say it again. Latex ventriloquist figures. Uh -huh. 
Um, but um, he's got a whole factory that cranks those out. And for me to do them one piece at a time, um, it's, it's hard for me to do, turn them around very quickly and right. do them economically. Now, can you tell us, uh, you know, people are watching, some of them are thinking, I could make this. How profitable is this? Uh, we always ask, we, we interview a lot of doll artists, and mm -hmm. we talk about the price points that could be sell, sold in the market. What's the case with puppets? Well, it, it depends. Um, like, it's hard, I think, to make a living as a puppet maker for people who do theater. So many puppeteers, uh, theatrical puppeteers, come from an education background or an art or a performance background. They don't have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And so uh, puppets for them, you can't charge much more than, than four or $500. Or, you know, even that's sort of on the outer edge for them because they have a lot of puppets and a lot of puppet shows. And so it's a, it's a nonprofit group there. And I don't know many people uh, who make a full-time living as puppet builders for theater. There are usually, it's usually puppeteers making their own puppets, performers mm -hmm. making their own things. Okay. Um, ventriloquism, it's just the opposite. It's very unusual for a ventriloquist to make his or, own, his, his or her own figures. Uh, so they are looking for people to make them and there are people there are not a lot again we're going back to the aardvark toenail clipping things but there are a handful of people who do make their living full-time um, making puppets for ventriloquists there are a lot of people who make puppets full-time for television or movies or special effects but they're also they're part of usually special effects houses um, mm -hmm. so puppets are among the things that they provide special effects for um, like, uh, or they'll make mascot characters as well. As well. TV commercials and corporate videos, do they use puppets at all? Very little anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I, I did a lot of business with that for years. The Muppets actually were very active in corporate videos for mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't even think that they do that much anymore. But for training videos, yeah, I did some things for Bank of America years ago, some computer training videos, they were actually, before they became Bank of America, they were known as Nations Bank back then, but I did a bunch of puppets for them. I did some puppets for a telephone company, training videos, um, lots of, uh, some learning to read videos, educational videos mm -hmm. um, for 10 years for a company based uh, just outside of Baltimore. Um, but puppetry, uh, making a living as a puppet maker is, is sort it's of tough. a tough road. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, ventriloquism, um, the price point can be higher for ventriloquists because they don't have many characters and they'll use those characters for years and years and years. If you think of Charlie McCarthy, Edgar Bergman used him for 30, 40 years, wow. that, one, that one puppet. Um, and so ventriloquists are accustomed to paying more character because they in their mind they're going to have it for years mm -hmm. got it i have a few more comments here for you uh tammy is saying einstein is wonderful tim how many hours a week do you dedicate yourself to your craft that's a good question i do have a full-time job when i'm not making the puppets my full-time uh pay the rent job is working for npr i'm a producer a senior producer on morning edition um but so these guys are a, a full-time, part-time job. There are times when it's, I'm going at it 40 hours a week if I'm crashing on a big project. But generally, on a per-week basis uh, on them, um, I may be spending 20 hours um, when I'm in between projects, you know. <laughs> we'll see. But it is a, a part-time thing for me now. Uh -huh. um, but I'm looking to dive deeper into the ventriloquist market. And so if it goes the way I'm hoping it's going to go, I will have a wonderful dilemma on my hand <laughs> of how much time can I spend on this and not go insane. That, yeah, true. <laughs> but it's a nice dilemma to have. This convention yeah. that you're going to, can you give us an idea of the number of attendees in that? I think it will be around 600 or okay. so, ventriloquists from all over the world mm -hmm. and from all different kinds of performers, from hobbyists to, um, 
to kids learning to adults who work on cruise ships and nightclubs and in Las Vegas. Oh. And the convention is a combination of, a, it's a place to see great performances. Uh, there'll be a lot of performing. Uh, they do a lot for young people who are learning where they can perform on stage and that get critiques from professional ventriloquists who give them tips and tricks. Awesome. And then there's um, the, the dealer's room. That's where you can go and buy ventriloquist uh, uh, figures from uh, puppet makers from all over the world. And then there's workshops uh, to learn how to perform with your character, how to make it seem like it's alive. And then also workshops on uh, how to do ventriloquism, how to pronounce the letter P without your lips moving. Uh huh. Or the letter B without your lips moving. Wow. That, it sounds fascinating. <laughs> yeah, it's, sure. it's, it's good fun. It's, it's, it's a good fun environment. And you meet a lot of interesting people. And so many of the ventriloquists, they, you know, with our Aardvark toenail uh, collection, the vast majority of ventriloquists do not make a living mm -hmm. doing it. Um, most of them do it as a part time thing. They're professionals, they're part time professionals. Uh, but it's a part-time thing, so you meet lawyers and doctors and and journalists uh -huh. <laughs> um, who do ventriloquism. I bet. I mean, the puppets are, would be perfect in any educational environment as well, right? Mm -hmm. Not only for kids. I think they, they can add to the experience of learning. Yeah, I, I think so. Are there puppet collectors? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. in fact, um, I just sold a puppet. Um, well, one of the figures I was planning to take to the ventriloquist convention, uh, um, a guy saw it online and he, he's, he's a collector and he mentioned some of the figures that he has and he has figures from some really high quality people and he, he wanted one from me and so I sold it to him uh, last week. And <laughs> so now I have two puppets I have to make for the convention instead of one. Because, <laughs> How many um, figures are you going to take? I think I'm going to take seven. Mm -hmm. um, Fingers crossed if I get this one done and another one I'm planning. That, that must be a very interesting experience you going through TSA with the dog. <laughs> yeah, actually one of the things I always like to do is um, put a puppet in a suitcase and leave the arm hanging out. <laughs> yeah, you would be delayed for the yeah. flight. This guy back here, Chuck the Chimp, somebody is already trying to get uh, claim dibs on him. Oh, really? So he may already be sold. I can't tell you who's going to, to uh, uh -huh. get Chuck, uh, but he's going to be ready to go. Yeah, I'm going to go to the convention, and I'm going to meet the ventriloquists. <laughs> That's so cute. It's so cute. Yeah, it's really fun, and I have a good time, and this guy's lips are moving. <laughs> okay, now his lips aren't moving. Do you like my profile? It's very, very cool. Bashing. I don't think people uh, care that your lips move. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. The ventriloquist would be really annoyed with me right now. <laughs> yeah. You know, all no, my dogs you, have no, voices no, too. Really, I, can't, I can't do ventriloquism. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really bad at it. I can't, I can't, I can't do it. I, I've tried. Yeah. It doesn't work. You I told me you have three dogs. Do they have voices? <laughs> yeah, they have voices. See, too. mine too. <laughs> We can't talk about that. <laughs> um, I have here uh, Sandy. <clears throat> Puppets remind me of my childhood. They are wonderful. Joanne, did you ever feel like giving up? I had some moments uh, when the puppet, when the uh, television work was drying up, uh -huh. and I was only making a few puppets a year. I had some moments there where I, where I was wondering, yeah. Um, it, it, am I done? Is this as far as it's going to go? And then there were also sort of uh, some creative roadblocks where I felt like I was making the same puppets and I wasn't improving. And so, so you go through that. And also when, when the jobs don't go well, when you, you, you work really hard on a character and in the end the client is not satisfied or the final project, mm -hmm. uh, the final video isn't what you uh, turned out to be. Uh, what wanted it to be. It was sort of interesting. Um, I was involved in a, a project, a video project, I guess about five years ago, where um, a, um, a woman was trying to do a series of videos based on math and puppets that were numerals. And, mm. and so I worked with another wonderful puppet maker and he made these great talking 
members and I performed with them and there were so many really talented people on this video and in the end it just was not very good. The, the, the video turned out to be so much less than the talent assembled to, put, to do it. On paper it should have been great but it, ju it just wasn't very good. Mm -hmm. And then years ago, I did um, a video, started working on a video for the company Hooked on Phonics, which are known for its reading programs. And they wanted to take some of the characters featured in their Hooked on Phonics books and printed materials, turn them into puppets and make a video. And in the end, the videos were never finished because it just, for whatever reasons, it just wasn't working. Mm -hmm. The puppets, of course, were marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> but the I, I'm not, I think it was the combination of the script, mm -hmm. uh, the scenarios they were trying to put those characters into. They, they weren't successful videos, and so they were never released. And that sort of hurts you put that much effort into yes, something. Yes. But I think, uh, Barry, uh, creators, we go through that either <clears throat> because of bad experience while uh, working or even uh, moments, I think, the teddy bear industry, for example, saw a huge shift a few years ago, almost went into extinction. Are those uh, something similar? Yeah, I used to go to a lot of those uh, teddy bear conventions mm -hmm. and art, art doll conventions just to see what I could learn, learning right. about sculpting techniques and materials and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But it's up to us to keep those alive. Yeah, yeah, but that's a market that really has sort of dried up because I think collectibles in general, you asked that question about puppet mm -hmm. collectors, I think the collectibles market um, ain't what it used to be. Mm -hmm. It isn't, and you have a generational behavior change as well. Baby boomers, they, they used to collect yeah, uh, a yeah. lot. As you know, we are more friendly to commercials, to buying than the millennials, and the millennials are starting, so money many times is not there. So I think we are in that void at the moment, <laughs> but hopefully they will start uh, collecting again. Tim is asking, where do you find your inspiration? Um, I, was it Irving Berlin or Bernstein? I can't remember. Some composer said, the inspiration comes from the phone call. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so for, now the puppets that I'm taking to the convention, these are all ones that I just sort of made up on my own. I call it puppet jazz. I just sort of improvised and came up with designs. But it's a hard thing to do. If you, if you just make your own designs, you, you, you tend to repeat yourself a lot. So having clients with very specific needs really forces you to grow as, 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 a, as an artist because you'll end up making characters, making creations that you would not have thought about on your own. I just recently I made a crow a blue crow for somebody. I never would have made a crow <laughs> on my own. I made a turkey for someone for a video uh, about uh, four years ago now. I never would have made a turkey on my own. It's not just a character that would have occurred to me to make. So having the clients, not only is it good uh, financially, but it, it's good creatively. It pushes you in boundaries, it pushes your boundaries in directions you would not have done on your own. That's great. You, you have a puppet that is also a detective, that is just a hand, correct? Oh, yeah. Now, that was a really, I, I don't know if you have a, a, a picture of that one. But this I don't was know if we do. I think I saw a video with that one. Yeah, the video. He's on my website as well. But it's basically this. <laughs> it's, yeah. a, it's an arm, and it's got a hat on it here, on the back of the thumb, and it's a trench coat. It was a character called Finger Detective. Um, it was done for a video for a, a, an educational company called Success for All, and they produce these learning how to read videos. One of the concepts they talk about is, is on big words. They're hard for kids to, to read big words. So if you cover up part of the words with your finger and gradually pull it back to reveal the words, it's easier to read. So they have a character called Finger Detective, who gradually reveals the word, reveals the secret of those letters. That's and so um, I came up with that character. Yes, we are going to show. We have the picture right here for you, for you guys to see. And it's fantastic because I would yeah. say it's challenging. You don't have the eye there. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it was a simple rod puppet. There's just a stick going up through the bottom of that thing. So his, his head can turn back and forth. 
and you can rotate his shoulders a little bit as he's walking. But it was, yeah, I never would have come up with, on, with that on my own. And they were, it was when they were talking about the concept of finger detective. <laughs> that's what came to my mind. <laughs> Actually, here's where it comes from, sort of chicken and egg sort of thing. I had that trench coat in my closet. I saw that kid, and I thought, that would make a great puppet someday. And I know so many artists do this. You, you'll see a material, and you'll buy that. You don't have a project in mind. And <laughs> the fact that I knew I had that, that, uh, that trench coat, uh -huh. that made me think, oh, I could do a puppet around that. And this guy that is going to show next, and you have a very cool fellow be beside it. Ah, uh, yes, Jimmy Fallon. <laughs> So my life with NPR and my life with puppets, it doesn't intersect very often. This was one of those cases. Um, morning edition, NPR's morning edition, well, we went up to New York to interview Jimmy Fallon because he'd written a children's book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I knew a photo op when I smelled one. So <laughs> I decided to take along a little Jimmy Fallon puppet with me. <laughs> and after we were done with the interview, I gave it to Jimmy Fallon. Yeah. And he gave me a wonderful gift in return which was ice cream. He had just been working with Ben and Jerry's and they came out with a new ice cream flavor mm -hmm. called the Tonight Dough. So he gave me a free sample. That's cool. <laughs> I saw that when he was launching that on TV. Yeah, so oh. I, I think I got the better end of the deal there. He got yes, a you did. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, I have a few more questions for us before we finish. Let me just find them now. <laughs> Uh, Patricia Buffington, the puppet, the puppet with the long nose over your left shoulder, what did you use for the hair? The hair, oh, that's a great story. Talk about, uh, so this hair, this lovely gray fluffy stuff, this was a bathroom mat I saw at Walmart. <laughs> uh, it's a really nice, I've done this before, I've gotten, I've used um, um, throw rugs uh, for materials um, a, a lot of times before, because if you're going to be walking on it, it's got to be really durable. And if you're going to make a, a, a puppet that's going to be thrown in and out of a case and people are going to travel with it, it needs to be a really tough stuff. There's a lot of fake furs out there that if you pull on it, the fibers come out rather easily. And this stuff is really, really tough and very durable. It was a nice color. And I've gotten, gosh, I think about four puppets out of that mat so far. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. And, and you know the neck, is it only foam or do you have something to... There's, there's just fabric in just that. Just fabric. Neck. Yeah, and, and that brings up a really good point because in a soft character, if I can get him off the stand here, come on off of there. In a soft character, a great deal of the expression comes from the neck. Oh. Because, because it's fluid, so... He can just be sitting there and doing this. Oh, gosh. And it uh -huh. comes, so in ventriloquism, with the soft figures, you, you have that head movement that just sort of swivels there. Mm -hmm. But with him, I can do that. So he can be really sort of checking me out here. It's like, so that, that expressiveness in the neck. And then as he talks, he can go back and forth like that. Mm -hmm. Every time I want to watch TV, my wife wants me to take out the trash. <laughs> uh, so you can just good. see that. So, uh, and then also, what you feel, I'm mad at him. Hey, you. you can, oh, that, that can that's fantastic. In, in the shoulder. Uh -huh. It adds a lot to the story. It adds to the expressiveness. So the neck, the fluidity of that neck uh -huh. really is, is an important part in soft figure creation and in puppetry. And also in animation, I've talked, I've heard people talking with computer animation about the stiffness in the neck. Uh, if a character seems to turn like this with their shoulder, then they, it takes away some expressiveness. Yes. yes. So if, his, if, he, if he only turned his body, as opposed to that little whoop, he can do like a double take. Mm -hmm. Hey, buddy. Yeah, what do you want? So yeah. again, that, that, that flexibility is really important. That's so cool. Guest 399, what about the blue lady behind Barry? Is there a story about the makeup? About the makeup? Yes, uh, there's a great story about the lady behind me. My Aunt Judy. <laughs> uh, so in Florida, I have a, uh, an aunt named Judy, and she's a wonderful painter. And she uses 
her color palette is fluorescent colors. Uh -huh. So she'll do jungle paintings in fluorescent colors. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to make sort of a fun female character. And I had this sort of idea for a snobby character. Um, but uh, so I, I consulted with and Judy to come up with a really sort of bold color scheme. And mm -hmm. that's very much the, on the Judy Safey palette that's cool. there. And so she and I consulted on the colors, on the coloration. Um, but I sort of had the mind, the expression, if you remember that picture of Milton that you, I, we showed mm -hmm. earlier, and that downward drop mouth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I really like that mouth. Yes. So I wanted to do a female character with that mouth. And this seemed to be perfect. perfect yes, yeah. we are not amused. <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah, that's Do fantastic. all these people out there. <laughs> Go away. I don't like you. Not at all. <laughs> uh, David Baker is saying his pirate looks like Jimmy Fallon too. Team, what did you use for the chest hair? Chest hair. Chest hair? Who's got chest hair? Who ha I think uh, Uncle Mort. Uncle Mort. Oh, that's just... <laughs> Now, that's just sort of the texture, I guess, on the, the fabric. I actually on tried to do, I actually spent a lot of time experimenting with chest hair on. I just want to do some little wisps on there. And I couldn't come up with anything that really read from any distance. So I left them off. But I did sort of rough up the fibers a little bit that to give a bit of a, a chest hair. <laughs> Sadie is saying she loves Uncle Mort. Hannah is asking, do you do look-alike commissions? Actually, let's show the next picture. And you answer the question. Yes, that's my good friend Ingrid. <laughs> Ingrid is a wonderful puppeteer based in Washington, D.C. And uh, that was her 50th birthday present. Oh, that's cool. So, yeah, I, but I do, uh, yeah, I do. Uh, in fact, when I first started in puppetry, that's what, how I was making, before the television work started, that's how I uh, was making my money, doing look-alike puppets for people. Oh, so I've, I've got, to, in fact, my, uh, I have a, uh, I did a puppet of Bill Clinton, which I gave to him in 1994, and that puppet is in the Bill Clinton Library. How cool. Um, and I did an, Al Gore, I had two presidential puppets, or two White House puppets at one point, <laughs> Bill Clinton and Al Gore. Uh -huh. I have done a, a Barack Obama puppet, but I never quite got the opportunity to give that to him. Uh -huh. Wow, cool. Uh, Mary... Uh, Mary Mary Whitmore, she's in New Zealand, and Margaret. I, I, I have a couple of puppets in New Zealand. I've sold people, puppets to people in New Zealand. She's asking, you answered that before, but could you review what the faces are made of? Uh, so the, the, the faces are made of polyfoam, foam rubber, seat cushions, and it comes in several thicknesses. I usually use half-inch uh, polyfoam on the faces. I'll use a thicker one-inch foam on the bodies or other parts. Um, uh, these are a couple of uh, puppet boobs uh, <laughs> that are under construction from my next puppet. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to re-rube there. But that's a thicker foam, and you can see the, the sculpting mm -hmm. there. Um, they'll look better when they're done, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, I'm, uh, um, here's a pair of hands that, you know, that I've got in the works for the, the puppets I'm working now. And these are two pieces of half-inch foam glued together and they're, they're sandwiching in wire so the, oh. the fingers can be posed. Cool. And then it's covered in a special material made for puppeteers, actually. It's covered in a, a stretch. Number one, the, whatever you cover with has to be stretchy. Mm. So um, at least a one-way stretch. And that way it falls into the contours of the faces without creating wrinkles. Um, the other thing that's important is something with a, a, a nap or a texture. So I use nylon fleece, antron fleece, known as Muppet fleece. But um, also what I'll use in, in the case of the Countess is made of polar fleece, mm. which lines the inside of jackets. And polar fleece is, comes in lots of wonderful, wonderful colors. And it's readily available in every fabric store. There's huge supplies of polar fleece. So it's, it's really a great go-to material uh, for puppet building. I, I prefer the Muppet fleece because it's a little more durable and, and hides the seams. But also, I can dye the Muppet fleece. Um, I can't dye polar fleece. You can get it in white, but it just doesn't take 
the dye uh, well. store bought. You have to do acid based dyes, and it's a lot, and then it's a lot more work. Than, I'm just too lazy for that. I don't have to work that hard. Right. Um, but the Antron fleece, uh, uh, the um, the polar fleece has a really nice look to it. It just mm -hmm. takes a little more work uh, to hide those seams. I think you can see make out it's the harder. seam a little bit uh -huh. under her chin there. But some of the other ones that I've got one coming down a cheek line there, and that's really hard to see. So it does work well. It's just it's a little more persnickety. Cool. But the, the results are good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Last question from Ginny. Have you ever created a puppet for your wife? Um, I did <laughs> um, do a lookalike puppet of my puppet. For, no, I don't really. I did one of her dog. Mm. But, and there was a, a lookalike puppet of myself that I gave to her, but I think it scared her. It was actually, it was, actually no, I think I've got this one. There was a, an art exhibition in Washington, D.C. called Washington self Portraits, where they asked D.C. artists to do self-portraits. Mm. And, and I was asked to um, do my own self-portrait and puppet. Didn't come out very good, and I think I tried to give it to her. Uh, she wasn't buying it. Wasn't no. buying it. She, she much preferred the diamond ring. Okay. Uh, Sandy Ward is asking if you use airbrushing on the fleece. You know what? I'm really terrible with an airbrush. I'm really quite bad with it. Let, let me, sh I'll show you what I use. Let me lean out of the picture here. Okay. And this is, this is my airbrushing. So pastel pencils. Mm. And what I do, and we can, uh, let's see. Well, we'll come with Uncle Mort here and show you. Um, so what you do with pastel pencils, you can get an airbrushed effect. In fact, you can sort of see, I'll bring them in closer, the, uh, the shadowing coming off here. So what you do is you take a pastel pencil, dr wet it, dr dip it in water, run it along the area where you want uh, the color, and then rub it with a toothbrush. Mm. Uh, and the toothbrush, the toothbrush, that's hard to say, toothbrush. It's hard. It, 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 it feathers it out and it gives it that, that shadow effect. Um, yeah. And I did that liberally on, um, on the Countess there. In fact, you can see there's mm -hmm. the toothbrush is still blue <laughs> from her. So just brushing it in mm -hmm. will do that. And then that for uh, rosy cheeks, what I do is I take the pastel pencil, rub it on a piece of sandpaper. So it's just colored chalk. And then I'll apply that with a paintbrush, just a quick pop, 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 pop. And you get the, the color in the, the cheeks. cheeks. Not sure how yeah. well that's showing up there. I love this guy. Very cool. But it, it gives you an airbrush effect without the airbrush. Um, because I, I, I do have an airbrush and I've done some airbrushing. But if you don't do it a lot, you have to sort of go back and teach yourself all over again. Mm -hmm. um, Sophie back in there did a lot of airbrushing. Uh, in her hair, or the, the airbrush look, the pastel pencils there. You can also do it with Sharpies. We think of Sharpies as permanent ink, but if you draw a line on with Sharpie and then dip um, a Q-tip in alcohol, the alcohol will blend the edges and give you a soft feathered look. Well, that's a great tip. Barry, I'm sure by now people are super excited about puppets. So for those that are thinking, maybe I should try to make one, what's your final advice? Um, you know what? Puppet building resources. There, there, are, there are some great ones out there. Um, there's one uh, called Project Puppet. And they sell pattern. They sell everything you need to make this style of puppet. They sell puppet patterns, the foam rubber, the Muppet fleece, and instruction, basic instructions how to put them together. Um, so that's a really good starting place. Um, there's, there's a lot of tutorials on YouTube for how to make puppets. And then my favorite uh, is the Stan Winston School of Character Arts. We were talking earlier about special effects and practical effects. Uh, the Stan Winston Studios were the studios that did the effects for the Terminator movies mm -hmm. and for the first of the Jurassic Park movies. Actually, I think they still did some Jurassic Park work. Even though we think of those dinosaurs as computer generated, there were a lot of puppets used in the, in the making of those movies. Well, now a lot of their artists, their sculptures, their puppet makers, their special effects people um, do these highly produced videos, wonderfully shot videos. And one of the uh, guys who 
build, uh, does, uh, one of the guys does puppet making videos. A man named BJ Geyer has an excellent series of how to make puppet videos. And they're about three, three hours long, step by step by step videos, highly recommended. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it'll give you that foundation. For me, um, when I was learning this stuff, the Muppets, of course, were a huge influence. But what I then, after learning how to do it, I really worked hard to make sure that my puppets did not look like the Muppets. Mm -hmm. So this guy is about as Muppety as I'll usually get. But uh, um, looking back there at at uh, um, Sophie, that's not that's a very different look from the Muppet Mort. Yes is a very different look from the Muppets. Because I'm using foam rubber and fleece, they're clearly from the same family. Mm -hmm. um, they would, they would, on stage or on TV, they would look comfortable together. But I, I worked hard to develop something that was my own, my own style. You create your own voice, right? Yeah. And Barry, for Barry. those that want to get in touch with you, maybe uh, ask for a commission, what are the best ways to get in touch with you? Go to handemonium.com and my uh, email address and phone number is on that website. Just if you um, go into how to order, you'll you'll see all you need to know there. <laughs> That's great. Taking commissions and Taking uh, commissions, yes. Um, or if you if you don't want a commission and just want to send me money, you can do that too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, you, they want to send you money. You accept it, no problem. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I, I would be willing to do that for the artist community. <laughs> yeah. I would be willing to do that. I would do that sacrifice. Kind of, <laughs> yeah, it's the kind of I'm a giver. I give. I give. Barry, thank you, thank you so much. much. Many people here are saying nice job, great, a, a great interview. Thank you for your time and you know for the bounty of knowledge that you have shared today with us. Uh, we hope to have you back here at some point. Thank you so much. And for you guys that have participated and have been here with us, again, thank you so much for your support. Don't forget that the videos will stay wherever you're watching, which means you can tell your friends about it so they can come and get to know more about Barry and the wonderful puppets that he makes, okay? See you back here next Tuesday. Thank you so much. Thank you, Barry.